just super humbled and honored and kind of shy being amongst all of y'all and all the power in this room. And I feel like I can just see your ancestors surrounding you, at your back, behind you, over you, affirming the amazing work you're doing on the land. You know, my family was part of the Great Migration, you know, exiled from South Carolina a couple generations ago. And there's a, a sad joy that comes, like, coming back this way and thinking about what we left behind um, and what we're now reuniting with. So it's really, really special to be here. You want to say something? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I should do my remarks, right? Or you want to? I think I think I think the way that we can, we can okay. just kind of flow, you know, it's all good. Okay. I mean, this is not as now, you know, academic. Where? Yeah, tomorrow will be a little more academic. <laughs> this is going to be a little more personal story. Yeah, I okay. thought it would be a good idea that instead of you know us getting into your whole presentation for tomorrow, <coughs> I would do something a little bit more <laughs> resonant for the moment, I guess, because we got predominantly people of color in the room, right? Yeah. And then tomorrow we might not. So how can we, you know, really cover some ground? <laughs> so there's a story I want to share with y'all that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, so I'm black, I'm also native, I'm also European, a lot of heritages. And recently at Soul Fire, we've been doing a ton of organizing work with native community because we're in a giant land reparations project. And frankly, it would be pretty disingenuous and messed up to do land projects without the folks who originally owned the land. And it has been humbling, fascinating, to understand all the ways that we have harmed each other as black and native folks, all the ways we've been in solidarity. You know, everything from Buffalo soldiers to Cherokee slaveholders. Um, so I wanna tell you the story that was gifted to me by Haudenosaunee elders. The Haudenosaunee are the original people, the Six Nations people of much of New York, which is where we are upstate. Um, in fact, the U.S. Constitution is partially based on their democracy. They have one of the oldest democracies. So this story is part of their creation story. It's about Sky Woman. And Sky Woman uh, is a deity, right? She's like the daughter of the universe. And she was like peeking down on humanity 10,000 years ago or so. It was the hungry moon. It's February. It's about now. You know, like all the food's running out. And all people have in their baskets is the seed that they're going to plant for the next year. Uh, so it's not looking too good. But she doesn't just want to help them out without really seeing what their character is. Right? So she goes down to the people in the longhouse and clothes herself as a beggar and puts out her hand and says, I'm hungry, you know, feed me. And the people, even knowing that their future was at stake, they're generous of heart. So they took all their seed from their baskets, you know, a little bit of dried this and that they had, and they cooked a stew, and they gave her the one bowl that they had. So seeing their open-heartedness, right, she reveals herself as God, as Sky Woman, and says, because you are good-hearted people, I'm gonna give you my three children as gifts. And my three children are corn, beans, and squash. Because you plant them together, right, the corn grows tall, it's rich in calories, and minerals, starches. It provides the support for the bean, which fixes nitrogen, provides the protein. The squash has actually natural pesticides that protect the bean, and it, the seeds are full of oils and the minerals. You know, so, so you're good Like if you have corn, beans, and squash. And so the people weren't hungry anymore. And I've been thinking a lot about this story because corn is the most sacred crop for Turtle Island folks, including the Taino, including like my ancestors from the Caribbean. And native folks here even gave it to Africans before the Portuguese ever landed in Africa. So it's a sacred crop in Africa too. It's the mother of life, it's 10,000 years old, you know, it's used in ceremony. When I was initiated as a queen mother in Ghana, like we were only allowed to eat like maize and millet. Those are the sacred foods, right? So, but you look at, it was also gifted to white folks. And I was, just, I was thinking a lot about what the colonizers did to this food. Monoculture, genetic modification, over-fertilization leading to the dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico, 
literally turning it into corn syrup that's being pumped into the veins of our children and fueling the diabetes and obesity crisis. Right? So it's like the bastardization of this sacred gift. It's the commodification of the Holy Mother Maze. And I've been just trying to reframe my whole situation at Soul Fire, my whole work, as how do we actually decolonize and re-indigenize our relationship to the seed, to the soil, to one another. Because we've all been colonized to some extent, we've all bought into it, right? So what is that work to actually extract and reclaim? Like our ancestral grandmothers, they braided the millet, the sorghum, the cow pea, the black rice, the melon, the molokia, right? Into their hair because they knew the seed was sacred and they fought in every generation to maintain the sanctity, but we're up against the empire. And so that's what I've been thinking about recently. What have you been thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've really been thinking about equity. Um, what does it mean for people of African ancestry to regenerate, uh, uh, regenerate spaces? Uh, what does it mean to be a person of African ancestry in Richmond, Virginia, and working to reclaim the land? working to feed community in the face of uh, opposition, I think. Uh